Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Hi there, and welcome back again to this week's episode. If you're new to the show, then please take a second to subscribe and even consider sharing the show with just one other person. This week, I am joined by Andrea Petrona. Andrea is an incredible executive coach and performance advisor to the CEOs. Andrea, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. And so it's it's a great opportunity to spend some time with you and congratulations for the podcast as an energy leader. So I welcome any initiative in our space. So as you said, I'm an executive coach, a performance advisor. I've been in this industry actually for more than 20 years uh, before I was as many in, in a corporate world. So I spent a lot of my time working around the globe in different roles from, men, from if, if you like, from engineering to management and leader. And then I led companies. So it's been quite an interesting journey until then I, I came to London, the UK to work for a consulting business. And then four years ago, I launched my own practice and, and also now cooperate and work with other firms as well. So essentially, that's what I do. So I focus on, as you said, on CEOs and senior executives. That's a primarily my area of focus. So I do a lot of you know work one-to-one with you know individuals, primarily in our industry, from, I would say, from North America to the Middle East. That's essentially been my remit. And I do work a lot with their teams. So I do a lot of work with their executive leadership teams for a different reason, right? So building team or teams that are dysfunctional, teams that need to get to a better strategy or their leading change. And sometimes I also get involved in some very specific initiatives like, you know, culture, like change, as I said. So it's very diverse, very, you know, keep me busy, keep me excited. And yeah, and finally, I'm also a speaker. So I speak at, at, at many energy events. So like Gas Tech, for example, one of the latest one. So I'm quite active in our space. Okay, excellent. So how did you get started off in the energy sector then? Well, I'm um, originally, I'm, an, I'm a geologist, by the way. So as a geologist, actually, I think I had the dream at the time to start working for uh, an oil company, right? Like many. But then I... To some extent, I worked for an oil company, but at that time I worked for a drilling drilling area, drilling business within that company. It was ENI at the time. So it was Saipem. So essentially, I never really worked as a geologist, but I worked primarily as, as an engineer. That's what I'm saying. It was more in a kind of an engineering career at the beginning. So with drilling contractors, so working in West Africa, North Africa, and many other places. So I started from as many in our industry, right? So we started from from the ground, from zero, so working on a, on a platform offshore, understanding the job. And then slowly, you know, slowly, but then very quickly, actually, then my career progressed in much more management role and then, you know, senior leadership role. Okay. Who was your role model and why did you find them inspirational? You know what? This question is so tough for me because... One of the reasons why I do what I do right now is because I did not really have so many great coaches or mentors in my career, to be honest. So it's a difficult question. And it is a question I ask myself many times. So, you know, who really gave me something, inspired me in my, in my uh, early in my career? And I would say probably there are a couple of people. So one was a leader, one of the senior leaders in my organization at that time that was, I think, wasn't probably inspiring, but it gave me the tool also, you know, in very straight way of communicating, you know, what I should really focus on earlier, which is, which was really difficult for me because I was really in a couple of years, I became a manager. I wasn't probably even ready for that. And the other probably real, real person that really became a model, at least, you know, for the first five years was actually a colleague. So a guy that was much more senior than me uh, than when I was in Egypt. and and. The company gave me the first drilling rig to manage on my own. That was offshore. It was tough, tough job also because the unit wasn't really up to up to speed, if you like, for a new contract that we had in place. And it really made my life made my life much easier because it's not, you know, it didn't only give me good, you know, advice from a business and technical standpoint, 
But I think what I learned from him was more about how to be calm, how to be, how to reflect on things, how to be strategic thinker and not get, get caught into details, including leading teams. So that was essentially my unique role model, if you like. At that time, I was so much into the business that was, you know, I didn't have any exposure to other role models in social media, for example, as we, as we find now. So for me, it was more about, you know, who is within my area of influence, who is, you know, close to, to where I live and where I work. And that was even essential. But then, you know, later on, of course, you start building different sort of role models. And now we have a completely set of different set of role models. Okay. What is the most challenging thing about your current role and how do you handle it? Well, my role is not having an executive um, job, if you like, not anymore in an organization, right? So I see things from a completely different standpoint. You know, I'm an outsider working for primarily energy companies at the leadership level and see how they operate and what they do. And my role essentially is inspiring them, giving them, you know, principles, but also building accountability and commitment so they can actually get better performance. That's essentially what I do, right? So the challenge for me is is a wonderful challenge because when I get involved, I have a such a huge opportunity to help them to make an impact, which is the reason why I do what I do. And, and by the way, I interview a lot of leaders, primarily in our industry. So one example is Lorenzo Simonelli, the CEO of Becky Hughes. He is, he's been one of my guests in my podcast, The World Class Leader Show. And he shared so many insights about, you know, what does it really mean being a CEO right now? All the challenges that you know, they come with a, with a role, right? So and many people, they don't really appreciate the level of challenges the CEOs are facing, primarily in our industry, right? The pace of change is so high. The situation has been so fluid, so really, really difficult right now from, you know, supply chain standpoint, from pricing standpoint, so from market constraints. So when I get involved, you know, these great leaders, they have a very different set of challenges. You know, each of them has his own, if you like, a set of challenges. But primarily, I would say my challenge is making sure that they are able to, to really perform in a completely different way. But you all start from the mindset. So most of my work actually starts from mindset. So changing people's mindset is the most important thing that can really lead to different performance, different results, and impact. So if I'm successful, then you see different people in front of you and you see how they differently uh, how they definitely actually operate with their own leadership tip, and then you see the results. So that's my that's my goal. It's not easy, but when I get hired, if you like, it's because they want to change their performance. So, but it's easy to help an organization increase their performance. I mean, what strategies do you do you put in place to do that? Well, it depends, first of all, what they mean by performance, because performance, you know, might have a different. Uh, meaning based on the context, right? So performance, primarily we think about, you know, revenues and profits. And, you know, ultimately, I think that is the final goal, right? But mm -hmm. most of the time, really, performance is how, you know, my team can operate in a better way. You know, how can I make sure that people, they're more strategic in their way of working? How can I make sure that the behaviors in the team and across all the entire organization change? They're not anymore based on the past, for example. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I'm stuck with the strategy definition right now because I don't see innovative ideas from my people. And then you, you know, you intervene in the area. So it really depends, again, what really is the meaning of performance in that specific situation. So the, my intervention, of course, varies based on that because, you know, it's not just about, okay, you know, I want to increase my revenues. Actually, it's never like that. Because, you know, when, when you, when you do what, you know, what I do, which is really a combination of mindset change, performance improvement and leadership development. So if you combine these three areas, then you can understand that, you know, you get a call when, when CEOs want to operate in that specific context, they don't want to get, you know, another consultant working on strategy development. Uh, or, uh, you know, IT consultants. So it's very specific what they're looking for. Essentially, is people. So it's getting different performance using or leveraging the quality of the people they have. Okay, interesting. I was also reading that you were um, a CEO at 35. How did you handle that? Did you find it difficult? What challenges did you face? Oh, yeah, it was difficult. 
<laughs> well, as I as I mentioned earlier, I I had a such an such an interesting fast track career, as many I would say in our industry, right? When things go well and there are opportunities there, you know, we we live in an industry where people get promoted quite quickly, you know, as of course, as long as you know you provide good results and uh, you know you you are open up to opportunities. So I became really, really quick quickly. First of all, a rig manager when I was 28, which is really fast. And then I I, I joined another company later on. I became a director of the entire quality HEC department, and it was a quick. And then I became a managing director, so CEO, if you like, of a joint venture company, and that was the age. So as many, I didn't have the tools. I probably felt like many others, a little bit of imposter syndrome. At the beginning, right? So, you know, you you grew up and you developed skills. By the end of the day, you know, when you get a new challenge like this, you know, you probably feel that you are not ready, right? You are unprepared. So how I approached it, I think, was, uh, first of all, I really learned it at that time, by the way, that's really helpful, you know, right now for the work I do is I really learned to listen. But listening intentionally others and getting their own ideas and using their ideas then to turn in them into into strategies, into business planning, into essentially building a future for the organization. So listening has been my main area of focus, if you like. And also, I would say a very high level of empathy. So making sure that you know people saw me as an open and transparent leader, not you know, not kind of you know those guys that you know they're, they're sitting in their offices, they close their doors, and uh, because you know they. If you like the value status and ego over uh, people, so I, I wasn't I wasn't like like them. So I was really open, transparent. So it was a I wouldn't say servant leadership. That's not what I'm talking about. It's more about a very open, transparent leadership. You know that involves people. So pretty much, you know, I think inclusion is so important. Inclusion is not just about gender. Inclusion is about making people engage, feel part of the same journey. And making sure that the future you're building is good for them too. So, it, you know, it, it's a leadership style, if you like. And I think at the end of the day, it paid, it paid well. So my, my career then developed since then. And then I think all these lessons have been super useful for what I do now. Because when I, you know, when I coach and I work with CEOs and also with our executive teams, it's not just the ability of listening and, you know, this, the leadership skill that I have or that I learned is more about also bringing my own lessons and my stories because, you know, we have been in the same space anyway. So, you know, when people resonate with what you have been through, that's much easier, not only building trust with them, but also then driving change in the organizations. Okay. I think it's important to be able to listen and to have an open door policy as a manager as well. Yes. Totally, totally. The question is how you listen, though, because, you know, it's so easy to say, oh, you know, um, I listen. But the question is what you are listening to. So, first of all, many people, so when, you know, in my work, for example, you know, many people, they used to say, you know, to me, say, look, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person that, you know, I normally listen to people. But the reality is how you listen, because if you listen intentionally, just you know, with the with the objective to learn from others, mm -hmm. without you know putting your own judgment, without getting interacting people, without letting your own perception and point of view steering essentially the conversation, that's good listening, right? So that's just the listening that you're looking for. That's the listening I'm, I'm trying to you know to encourage people to do in their organization. So. So listening is important as long as it's intentional, it is not, there is no distraction. It's really the aim is to understand others, you know, other people and their point of view. And the open policy, I agree with you, is absolutely important. Now, I know someone might say, yeah, you know, but if it's too open policy, then, you know, I will get distracted and everyone will gonna come to my office or they will ask for help. Well, that's, I think, what a leader is supposed to do. I mean, leader is supposed to help others to achieve their best, you know, or out of their performance, right? Best of all, best out of their abilities. So I think that is really the primary role of the leader, getting the most out of people. You know, in my interviews, in my podcast, believe me, when asked this question, what has been the most significant factor for your own career success and performance? Believe me, 90% of them, they said, it's my team. 
is my people, the ability to help me when I need it, the ability to help me to, to make better decisions, to get better ideas, to build better strategies. So, you know, I, I don't think we are saying something new, right? But the question is, there are many leaders, they, they think that, you know, is is everything is up to them. You know, they are the, the soul ranger. They are, you know, the guy leading the company and it's, it's all about them. But that's not what I think a good leader today is supposed to, to be, it demonstrates in front of others. No, I agree because I've interviewed some incredible people and they all credit their teams with helping exactly. them achieve, achieve a success. And I think, I think it is important. You're only as good as your team. Always, always. That's why one of the recommendations actually I give to, to my clients is, I know sometimes it could be harsh, but it's so important having the best team possible working with you. And I appreciate, right, that, you know, if you inherit a team, because maybe you're coming from a different company, I appreciate that, you know, you don't want to let people go. I appreciate that you don't want to hurt people. But at the end of the day, at some point, you have to give people the opportunity to step up. And that's absolutely important, right? So that's your leadership. However, if you feel that, that you know, that team, that specific person is not the right one for the goal that you have for the future you want to build, you know, eventually you have to make a choice whether, you know, that team is the right team or not for, for what you want to achieve. Sometimes, unfortunately, leaders, you know, t- they tend to be a little bit too much protective of their, the current team, but then blame you, you know, about the performance. So, you know, it, it, as good as is being a good leader and be social and be nice with people, it's also important to understand leadership is about performance, is about results. Probably is all about results. So, you know, I think then it's important how you lead in order to get results, right? That's the real question. But leadership is about is all about results in organization. Yeah, I agree. We do agree. So, how does your current role compare to your aspirations as a young boy? Well, to some extent, it's very similar. It's like having having closed a loop. When I was a young boy, of course, I didn't even know I was an executive coach, performance advisor. I can't say that. That was clear to me at the time what I wanted to become. But what I knew is I wanted to to make an impact. And then you know, impact for everyone can take you know different shape or form based on your career development. But the only thing I can tell you that when I was a boy, when I was a teenager, I knew that I was you know hopefully on you know uh, on this planet to make an impact. Now I think I found the perfect way for me to make an impact to the society. Because if these CEOs and these organizations, especially in our industry, by the way, they're able to make an impact to, you know, sustainability, to the environment, to better energy, to clean energy, that's really impact. So if with my work, they're able to step up and act differently and get that to the society, you know, definitely I'm fulfilled. I feel that, you know, I... You know, I, I achieved what I wanted to, to do earlier and right now. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anything that you still want to achieve in your career? Oh, so many things. So many things. I'm a very ambitious person. So for me, it's always setting, you know, the bar higher and higher. So there are so many things that I'm planning to do or, or I would like maybe, to, you know, in a different version of myself as well. I want to be maybe in the future. So there are some things, you know, in my mind, definitely is writing books because I think it's time to, you know, to start sharing my my lessons, my knowledge, you know, and, and give an opportunity to, to give it to a broader audience, of course. There are elements of, you know, increasing the, the quality of, you know, and the level of, of the business. But in the reality for me, it's more important, honestly. It's not... It's not really much about money and size and growing that way. It's more about keep keep really developing myself and keep, you know, staying curious and keep learning because I can tell you, you know, just in the last 12 months, I learned so many things I couldn't even imagine before. So I think that is really my fuel. That's my driver. So if I get the level of, you know, consistent learning every single year, the other outcomes like business outcome, like, you know, revenues or projects or clients, they will come. I'm not really worried about that. It's more about how can I keep, you know, raising my bar and not feeling at any point complacent, which, you know, 
I think is the risk of every leader, right? When you get complacent, then you stop learning. When you stop learning, you stop winning. So I think that's really what should be the real, you know, drive, you know, having this fire that keeping you constantly, you know, ready to go to the next level. And that has been my career. I mean, it's not always easy. I can tell you, it's not always nice because when you feel that there is always something else to achieve, the sense of urgency that that's, that's not really helpful sometimes in your life because you you know there is a risk that you don't feel really I wouldn't say happy right but you don't feel really that you go where you want it to be there's always something else to do so I think that is a risk of of ambition to some extent and personal development too I do agree in your opinion what makes an outstanding hire well, it's a difficult question because there are so many elements of that. I think for me, probably, I think it's all about attitude, Michelle. I mean, the typical hard skills, like, you know, the, the technical expertise that we have, the skills that we have. The question is, you can be the best, you know, in your case, for example, engineer or, you know, myself, a geologist or other people, right? You build, you know, the level of skill set, right? But the question is, I mean, do they skill really make you difference? make you really different in the, in the workplace, they might. So, uh, you know, I fully agree with the fact that, you know, we're looking for specialists here in, in, in the business. I do believe, you know, that we need that. But the reality is I wasn't myself a specialist. You know, I mean, I was a geologist, but I never really worked as a geologist. I was an, an engineer by, not by education, but by fact, based on the work. But was a real engineer? No. But I think I've been successful at the end. So I think it's... I think there are many other areas, you know, many elements that probably build success. But look, I think if I, when I look for a hire, I would certainly look for attitude first, you know, the eager to learn, the eager to, the passion, you know, to do what you, what you want to do, the drive, the persistence and the perseverance to, you know, to make things happen. That's what I'm looking for, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, the, the ability to connect the dots, the curiosity. That's what I'm looking for. You know, you can be the best possible technical manager or, or, or a guy, right? But if you lack this, you know, these skills, the, the one that I just mentioned, honestly, I think it's going to be very difficult then to make an impact in your organization, but also in your future as a career. So that's what I'm looking for. I think, you know, those companies that are just looking for Technical skills, I think they're making a mistake because attitude at the end of the day is so critical. And this, probably the other area is about cultural alignment because honestly, there are so many great people. They might be probably great, potential great leaders. They might know the industry. They, they might have you know the right expertise. But then if they don't fit into the culture of the company, they're going to at some point fail anyway because culture is really what drives you know performance. So I'm sure that you have seen too. You, I've seen so many people, great people, but then, you know, in one company, they did not, you know, perform properly. And at some point, either they left or they've been fired, but then they moved to another company and then perform incredibly well. That tells you that it's never about the skills. It's definitely about the attitude, but also the alignment with the culture. Okay. Do you, re- do you think it? Do you really believe that that the cor- the the corporate culture can make a difference to someone's uh, career? Big time, hundred percent, hundred percent. Because you know, if you if you get into and I'm, I don't know your experience, Michelle, but myself, I mean, at least I got twice in an organization where the culture was not probably the right culture for me, and then I was frustrated. There was a misalignment with the leadership. I didn't feel my passion there. I felt for it for a reason or another not happy at work. So at some point, my performance, of course, they got, you know, at all. They got they got in, you know, impacted by that. It, it, it's always like that. That's why one of my recommendations to to people from from a hiring standpoint is ask as much as possible questions about the culture and organization before that the, you know before that you get you get uh, you get a job and likewise you know hiring manager making sure that you ask questions you understand from from the people from the candidates whether they are a good fit from a cultural standpoint because believe me you know if there is if there is a clash and you know 
cultural clash essentially means different behaviors, but behaviors are driven by values, right? So if the values and behavior are so different in organization than what you are, who you are and what you are, your personal behavior in terms of ethics, work ethics, in terms of commitment, in terms of communication, at some point, there will, there's going to be a clash. It's Unfortunately, it's inevitable. So honestly, it's better to not even start a job if you feel that that is not the right company for you, regardless, you know, what is going to be on the table in terms of offer. Interesting answer. Thank you. You're welcome. So have you had any career disasters and how did you handle them? I definitely had a career disaster. And that is one of the couple of examples I was giving you just, just a little bit earlier is I joined a company because I was so excited about moving more into the commercial area. That was something that I was missing at the time. And, and I knew I need that in order to, to have you know, much more broader experience about a business. So I joined this role as a, as a director of sales and marketing. That was, gosh, probably 10 or 12 years ago. But what happened, I was coming at the time from a very large organization. And uh, I got myself into a very you know, entrepreneurial business, which is fine, but it was a family business. And what I realized, I was not the right person for that family. <laughs> and that was my mistake because the culture, culturally, you know, the, there wasn't a fit. So that wasn't a fit. And I knew it, but I accepted the risk because I overestimated my ability to go over these challenges. But at some point, unfortunately, I, I you know, I needed to leave because that was honestly too difficult for me. Dealing with the family that had a completely different approach about business, protective, not, you know, having not enough trust on new commerce people coming from the outside, from, you know, from, from outside. So I suffered a lot. I tried to, you know, to some extent to drive change internally, but then I realized that was bigger than me because, you know, that was their own business. That was like, again, family business. So there was a big lesson for me to say, okay, you know what, next time, yeah, you have to really remember that if you really want to work for a small company, well, you have to remember that probably family business is not, is not your thing unless you're fully aligned with the family. Okay. Thank you. What is your zone of genius? What are you excellent at? I think I'm very good in enrolling people. I think I'm good on getting people really involved and engaged when I speak, when I talk, when I work with them. It maybe it's my communication skills, maybe something different, maybe it's how, can, you know, how I show up. But definitely I know I'm influential. I know people listen to me. They take advice. They do what, you know, what we agree together. They participate. They are involved, engaged. So I think enrollment probably is the number one, I would say. And then, as we said earlier, I think I'm, you know, I'm really generally, generally interested to, to know people and help them. So people probably feel that, probably, you know, feel that there is no a second objective. There is no a different agenda. I'm, I'm there for them and with them and I'm fully engaged with them. So I think, I think that is important, right? Because, you know, for the, for the work we do, we, we might, we might get the risk of, be a teacher, you know, or be too much consultant and say what, you know, people what to do, but that's not my job. My job is helping them to get their own answers, to get their own ideas, and then make sure that, you know, they make things possible by, by taking action. So I think I'm probably that's my, my, my areas. I you say, you know, how you call it, uh, how do you, how did you call it, by the way, that I love that the genius area of genius, right? Yeah, it was genius. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's it. That's really my my genius. It's not, you know, it's not IQ. It's not like a specific skill I have. I think I'm I'm able to make sure you know that people change their mindset and take different action, which is huge if you think about. Yeah, that is a huge skill. Yes, and very important skill to have. I would say. Yes. So, what does your average week look like? Average week. Yeah. In terms of working week. Okay. So how I spend my week. Yeah. That's yeah, the question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I learned something very important, Michelle, is blocking time. And blocking time has been one of the most successful action I've taken because otherwise you can really get derailed by so many things that are happening at any given time, emails and calls. And so 
I understand where I'm much more uh, energetic. I know when I can actually be very creative. And normally that time, which is for me, is in the morning. I take it for myself. I make sure that I block time. Sometimes it doesn't work, but essentially what I'm trying to do. I also have a routine of spending at least an hour, if I can, walking, just walking. And for me, although I'm a sport person, but walking actually is even much more rewarding to some extent because I can really think about, you know, my life, my future. I'm really strategic when I'm working. I have that sort of, pay, you know, peace and freedom in the nature, hopefully, you know, to, to think, you know, to reflect what I'm doing, whether it makes sense, right, whether I can do things differently. And that is a private time. That's a time for me that I can't trade for anything else. And so I'm not the kind of a guy that necessarily stop working earlier. I don't mind because I love my work. So I can even work later in the day. It doesn't matter as long as I have these two moments. So essentially it's walking and then blocking time for being more creative. That's good advice. I think exercise helps you no matter what type of exercise you're doing. I think it helps you clear your mind and to help you think as well. To reflect, Absolutely. To reflect on what your how your day is and how everything's going. At least for me, but I think it, I think it actually works for everyone. Yeah, because everyone has a different way of approaching things. But for me, it's been a game changer. I've been a sports person for for all my life, but I wasn't really someone walking before. You know, I used to walk only from going from A to B, right? But this was not really practice, a kind of a habit in my day. And since I started to do that, and I, I believe at the beginning, I thought, well, this is going to be really, really boring. Well, now I really feel I appreciate the value of that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it as well. I'm quite a, a sporty type of person as well. And I do appreciate being able to, to do some sport. It helps me think and de-stress as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So who do you depend on in your working environment? Well, I'm not actually no one because, you know, I've been working on my own for many years. Now I join, you know, forces with another consulting firm. But the reality is I don't depend, I'm, you know, I, on others. It's uh, I have a leadership role in many projects with clients. So, yeah, I think I, what I, I think I really learned working alone. So I really value being independent. But because I work with projects, also large clients, then I have a team working with me. So, you know, an amazing team working for a project right now. So it's it's so great. So, yeah. So I have the right people around me that can help, I would say. Do you find it hard to be responsible for everything that you do? No, it doesn't look hard to me. It gives you more pressure, that definitely. Yeah, so it's an element of pressure. But it's not just, I don't think it's harder. Probably because I used to, you know, I've been leading projects of companies for many years. So I think I I understand that as long as, of course, you know, the challenge level is within your ability level, but also is within your area of comfort or your area of expertise. But sometimes, you know, you stretch anyway yourself outside of your comfort zone because sometimes, you know, the projects that I undertake are bigger or different than what I did in the past. So there is an element of stretching myself every single time. But I take this as an amazing opportunity to learn. I don't see this as something harder. But again, definitely there is a, an element of pressure when you get when you get involved, you know, in projects that are they're difficult, they are uh, potentially have a strong impact on, you know, people and results. So yeah, but again, not having now anymore a leadership and executive role in an organization, but more like someone as an outsider, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, it's less pressure because there is always pressure to deliver, right? Because they have people that have expectation in you. But for me, it's more about making sure that, you know, as we said before, they can step up the game and actually get different results. So the pressure is always there. It's not harder. It's different, I would say. I think you have pressure nowadays. Well, even before, I think everybody has different types of pressures in every job that they do, no matter whether they work for themselves or work for someone else. Yes, the pressure has increased, Michelle. I do agree with you. And for a, for a number of reasons. One is I think COVID has accelerated the pressure because when there was COVID, so people they used to take, they were forced to, right, to take, you know, more time for themselves, you know, maybe slowing things to some extent. But then as soon as COVID, you know, has 
I wouldn't say is ended because it's still there, but would say it's not anymore an emergency. I think everyone, everyone in the planet has actually started to recover, but the recovery, unfortunately, was much, much more quicker. It's still very, very quick than what was essentially the the world that was before before COVID. So now I think we all got used to a completely different pace at work. So I think that recovery element that is, is shouldn't support, I mean, it shouldn't be here anymore, right? But it's still there. I think we have inherited and we build the habit of being so busy every single day as if, you know, something happens tomorrow. So there is an element of that. And also I think the market has changed and volatility, there is more pressure about changing things because there is so many situations like supply chain, especially in our industry, if you think about it. Supply chain is a huge problem. So from, from one side, you want to speed up things. From the other side, you may be to slow down because you don't have alternatives in terms of equipment, or products or deliverables, right? So I think it became a habit, which is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, I agree. I do agree with that. So what keeps you motivated when things get tough? Well, for me, it's the bigger picture. It's, it's always been the bigger picture. So the bigger picture, the future that you want to create for yourself is the only driver for me, is the North Star. So it's what keeps me motivated because every single day you get, you know, sidetracked by things. And sometimes things work, sometimes people, you know, sometimes other things don't work. So you're trying to be, the only way to be motivated for me is keep thinking about, okay, you know, what is my true north, right? What is my purpose? Okay, let's let's move forward. You know, think about the future. Think bigger because whatever makes you, you know, frustrated or gets in your way on a single day, although it might be part of that journey, it might be a component of that. So it's a step to get to that vision, but it's still just one single step. So, you know, take it easier, take it more, uh, you know, don't take it too much, I would say, too personal. Because we tend to, I think, we tend to see challenges or roadblocks or failures or setbacks, whatever we want to call them, as the worst things that can happen to us. And then we get affected and our motivation goes down. So I think for, for me is, okay, don't see the small thing, don't see the small step or the single step, because there might be another step you can take, as long as it's directed to the right purpose. Okay. That's an interesting answer, actually. Mm. It is. So I've got one final question. If you could turn back time, would you change anything? No, nothing at all. It's a question asked as well in my podcast, Michelle. And I can tell you 100%, I have zero regrets. I mean, things, you know, I could have taken different paths as everyone. But, you know, based on where I'm right now, it's I'm just very happy. I'm very happy about what I, what I did what I achieved. Yeah, I could have taken different path and made different decisions, but I wouldn't be who I am right now. So I think whatever happened in my 20 plus years of experience has been just uh, necessary to some extent to get where I am right now. So it's a part of the journey. So it also, uh, you know, living with regrets, I think from my personal standpoint, I think it's just difficult to deal with because the regrets then they turn into, you know, into you know, lack of satisfaction or lack of motivation, as you said. So I don't want to live in that space. I don't want to be in that space. I do prefer, okay, you know, whatever happened, happened for a reason. And everything, you know, everything builds you, who you are, your identity, your story. So, no, I'm, I think that for me, regrets is not an option. That's a really good message to end on. So thank you very much. <laughs> Great questions. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. That's all the questions I have today. I would like to thank Andrea for your time. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a pleasure. That brings us that brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you for listening and see you next week. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'd like to gently encourage you to leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with another person. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or via my website, www.michellefraserconsultancy.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.